All right, guys, not every day you get to interview uh, an astronaut. This was uh, such a great episode. Astronaut Shane Kimbrough, pleasure to have this guy on the show, a treat to talk to, and you guys are gonna get a lot of value out of this and maybe learn some stuff too. All right, let's get into it, Shane Kimbrough. All right, Shane, uh, stoked to have you on this episode. <laughs> um, I've been wanting to interview you for a while since I first met you. So welcome to Fireline Podcast. I'm excited about this. Great to be here. Honored to be here. And I look forward to our conversation today. Yeah, cool. Uh, I started doing some research online, you know, type Shane Kimbrough into the internet and started just like collecting some bullet points of your resume. So I'm just going to read these off so anyone listening can just get an idea of a little bit of your background. So you're Texan, uh, you're a West Point grad, you got a bachelor's of science in aerospace engineering, uh, master's of science from Georgia Tech, uh, you're an army officer with a colonel rank, army aviator, served in Desert Storm, you commanded an Apache helicopter company, a Nassau astronaut, 388 days in space, nine spacewalks and correct me if i'm wrong on any of this uh, almost 60 hours of spacewalking time uh you were a commander of the international space station uh, you're fluent in russian and just to top it off a husband and father of three the most important yeah, yeah. just to <laughs> yeah. cherry on top. a quick clarification yeah. on being a texan i was born in texas but i was a military brat so we moved around a lot so i only lived in texas for about a month <laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> and uh, I call it Atlanta home. That's where I spent most of my time growing up. I'm from about fifth grade on. And so just want to make sure people people understand that. Fantastic. Um, so explain a, little, a bit about your background. You say you're 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 from born in Texas, but George Swit was growing up in Georgia Lake. Yeah. So, I mean, my elementary school years were I was in Germany um, as a kid growing up. And so really incredible experience, honestly, to see different culture and uh, grow up in the, the American school system, but overseas, that was, that was pretty neat. Uh, but then, like I said, about fifth grade, um, we came back to, to Georgia and uh, grew up there, really loved it, had some great opportunities um, with schooling and athletics and things that I was interested in back then, which really set me up for going to West Point uh, and then being a career Army officer. What did your mother and father do? So my dad was an Army officer as well. Um, he was uh, back then... They couldn't be aviation branch, but he was a pilot in the Army, um, flew in Vietnam, um, helicopters and fixed wing aircraft. Uh, but he was also a field artillery officer. So back then they would alternate assignments. So you do a field artillery assignment, then an aviation assignment. And so that's kind of how we bounced around with, with his career. My mom was a school teacher, um, uh, taught middle school for most of her career, but also elementary school. What was that like moving around as a kid? Was it just something you were good with or was it yeah you know it's it's not easy right it's it's uh, it can be challenging and I know there's lots of people in careers that do that these days and it's hard but when I look back on it it was really a special kind of unique group um, and you kind of run into the same people every now and then as you move to different locations and reconnect but it also made you resilient it made me um, realize that okay I'm going to have these friends for a couple of years and then I'm going to have to go create a whole new group of friends in a couple of years. Um, and so it just helps you kind of, I think, mold into different environments pretty easily um, because you're going to be seeing them every couple of years, it seemed like. Um, now, we were a bit fortunate in that, you know, when, once I got to fifth grade, we stayed. We were very stable. And, and my parents made some sacrifices, which I didn't understand at the time. Like um, after maybe eighth grade, my dad decided to go to Korea for a year unaccompanied, but by doing that, that allowed us to stay in Atlanta for another three or four years after that, which got me through high school and things like that. So didn't understand it at the time, but uh, those are decisions my parents were making in order to kind of keep us stable from that point on. That's an interesting point about learning while you're young, like learning that you're just going to have friends for a little while and then you move on and it doesn't mean you lose them as friends, but you might not see them again for a very long time, if ever. Uh, the trades is like that a lot, you know, especially line work. I mentioned this to my kids quite a bit because coming up to graduation, like I just had one kid that graduated and 
um, he, you know, we, school is everything. Like when you're a kid, right. And when you move out of school, it's like, you just want to keep attachment to these friends and not realize that there's this big world out there and you're going to make friends for five months. And then, you know, line works a lot like that. Good, good group of people for five, six months, maybe tops. Mm-hmm. And then you might not ever see them again. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's hard for a young person to understand that. Right. But it's reality and it's actually a good thing in a way, or it can be a good thing. Athletics. Did you do much for athletics? Yeah, that was, that was kind of, I was into anything sports growing up. Um, kind of settled on baseball, football, basketball, kind of the standard U S sports, um, through high school. Um, but I would, you know, ski golf, you know, anything sports related I'd loved and was into. The decision to go into the military yourself, was that just a no brainer? That was just something you had to do or you knew you wanted to do, or what was that defining moment? Yeah, that was, um, none of the above from what you just said there. Um, it was an interesting path, how, how it turned out. Of course, my dad was a career military officer. You'd think it'd be a no-brainer, but um, anywhere we lived, we did not live on post or on base. Um, I think that was intentional um, by my parents to not be the only way, you know, only thing that we saw as kids um, growing up. And so I really knew nothing about the military, um, didn't know the rank structure, didn't know anything. And literally, I was a career kid right in the military. So um I decided to go to West Point, and when that happened, obviously I knew I was going to be serving in the military after that. But, you know, that decision was a very last-minute decision, I would say. I mean, there's you have to prep and you have to you know, apply and things like that, but it wasn't uh, something like, hey, I always wanted to go there. It was my dream. Um, it was probably farthest from the truth there. I did, I did no interest in going there. Um, but once I started looking at it and kind of, you know, get, making a few trips up there. And uh, I was a recruited athlete there. And so, you know, got treated pretty well when I went on my recruiting visit and things like that. And, and of course, they're not showing me all the hard stuff, the bad stuff, right? Um, but it, so it looked great. It was an incredible opportunity that honestly I couldn't pass up uh, when it came down to it. So, you know, I decided late kind of April-ish, May of my senior year, which is pretty late deciding where you're going to go to school. Uh, but I just couldn't turn that opportunity down. And it ended up being, you know, an absolute, you know, very tough, challenging thing to do. But again, that uh, that kind of set me on a path for I wanted to do hard things. Um, and I've kind of lived that my entire career since then. And, and that's what kicked it off, really, was doing doing something that was hard, unique, not something that everybody else could do. Um, and then taking advantage of the opportunities it gave me and the leadership challenges and, you know, you know, I guess events that they put me in and things that it put me in to, to grow as a person and a leader really set me up to be successful in the Army and eventually at NASA as well. What do you think, like, where do you think that came from, that that wanting to do hard things? Because, like, not everybody has that. Did that come from your family or? Yeah, I think there's a lot of it in my family. I mean, very blue-collar um, family. I grew up with my grandparents, um, citrus farmers and, um, you know, parents, military and and school teacher and just, you know, the, the work ethic and, and knowing that uh, if you work hard, you know, you generally can be successful. And what I learned is working hard just opens doors. Um, and so those doors are all different for all of us, but uh, the ones that had opened for me ended up being pretty cool for one. Um, I was able to serve my country throughout all of those doors that opened, which is really special to me. And uh, even broader than that, to NASA, we're not just serving our country, we're serving all of humanity. So huge responsibility, but also really rewarding to do th- do something like that. Why why West Point? Why did you pick West Point? Uh, that's really the only military academy I looked at. I was, uh, I was a baseball player getting recruited to do that in college and um, was hoping to go to, honestly, different schools. But um, those didn't, you know, just wasn't, just didn't feel right in the end. And so West Point, again, very prestigious place, um, was honored when I got, got selected to go there and, and got in, which is not easy. Yeah. Um, and then, so, you know, I just decided to go there and give it a shot and see what I could do. Of course, you know, first six weeks when you get there, kind of the basic training and boy, yeah, every day, not just me, but everyone in my classmates is like, what did we get ourselves <laughs> into? And, you know, you just, it's just a cool process where, you just kind of try to get to the next event, try to get to the next day, right? And then they, and then all of a sudden a week's gone by and two weeks have gone by and you're almost done with basic. And 
Um, and that camaraderie that you have uh, when you do hard things together and have these experience of hard things together, those are kind of bonds that can't be ever broken and they're just neat shared experiences. And whether that was basic training at West Point or going on a space flight, the very similar kind of things sure. where you're having these really unique, tough, challenging, hard experiences that we get to share. Interesting. What made you choose what you chose to study when you went to West Point? <laughs> That's a good story. Um, now, I was kind of certainly certainly inclined towards the math and sciences. I'm really more math okay. um, versus English and history and those kind of things. And so you figured I'd be doing something related in the STEM fields. And that's, that's true. That's what happened. But the way it happened was kind of funny. I was uh, my roommate and best friend. Um, as we were kind of, I guess, towards the end of freshman year, we kind of had to decide what we wanted to do um, major wise. And my buddy was all set on aerospace engineering, um, probably the hardest thing you could do at West Point. Um, so this is a little bit straying from my things and wanting to do hard things. It wasn't like, oh, that's the hardest thing. Yep, I want to do that. I saw that. I was like, oh, I don't want any part of that. That is way too hard. But <laughs> my buddy talked me into it is the way it worked out. Oh, heck yeah. And so I, right, let's do this together. And uh, so we, we decided to do it together. And again, super challenging, really stretched me. Um, but I, you know, it was a great thing I, I got to do. And it set me, set me up to, had no idea it was going to set me up to, to, be, you know, be competitive, to be an astronaut one day. But that's, that's really, a, a, you know, one of the key parts of it. So did your buddy stick it out with you? Make it oh, yeah. 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 Cool. So we did. Was that like, was that something that really helped too? Like having an accountability of course, partner? Yeah. Our group, you know, the group of aerospace engineers in my class was pretty small. I mean, it was in the maybe 15 of us or 20 of us total that decided to, to, to make this leap into us. All of us were pretty tight because uh, you were going to be lab partners with, with almost everybody at some point during the, the journey. Uh, but it is important to your point of having you know, at least a close confidant accountability sure. partner through any hard thing you're doing, right? So, and I encourage you, um, for those of you that are out there that, that don't have that, please find somebody, a mentor, a friend, or whatever to to, to help you and to share the experience with you. And it, it could be your spouse, too. I mean, it could be anybody, but it's important to have somebody there to lean on. Yeah. Um, how do you track after this? Like, go to West Point. How do you decide to go Georgia Tech after that? Or what was your path after that? Yeah, so coming out of West Point, uh, generally you go serve um, about five years in the military. That's your payback to, to going to the military academy. Okay. Um, my path was a little bit different because, um, again, I was like, what is, what is hard? What, is, what, what, is, what does everybody want that everybody can't get? And for me, that was aviation, the aviation branch. Top Gun had just come out. The original Top Gun had just come out, right? So didn't matter what service you were in, everybody wanted to fly. And, uh, and there's more hurdles to jump through with physicals and things versus being an infantry officer or, or something like that. But um, So I decided to do that uh, or, or apply for it. Um, got selected, luckily. And then if you go to flight school, your commitment's a little longer because your five years doesn't didn't start until after you graduated flight school, which is about a year and a half. So it's about a six and a half year or so commitment. But um, and back then, that means a lot. Um, of course, once you get into the military and you're doing great jobs and loving what you're doing, the, the commitment didn't really matter. But uh, back then, five years, six years was a long time. Um, and so I went to flight school, um, did really well there, and got the chance to um, pick Apache helicopters um, kind of in the mid middle of flight school. And then I went to that course as well. During that time frame, the Gulf War had kicked off back in 1990. Um, and, and I knew the unit I was going to already, and guess what? They are already deployed. So I figured, guess what? Since I get done with this course, I'm going to be deployed. And if you remember back then, or you probably don't remember back then. I do, but, actually. I but do. back then, wars weren't going on. It wasn't yeah. a common thing. I mean, kids these days, they've only known war in their yeah. lives, you know, the 20-somethings, because we've had these wars going on. But back then, it just wasn't a thing. And so it was interesting. It was fresh. It was unique. Um, and... Yeah, I got the opportunity literally right after graduating from the Apache course, went right over to Saudi Arabia, joined my unit, and uh, the commander was like, okay, you're crewed with that gentleman. He got here last week, and you're in charge of these six Apaches. You're the platoon leader. Dang. So you're talking about jumping from, Dang. like, the classroom to, like, real yeah. situation right off the bat. 
incredible experience. You know, when I look back on it, those four or five months I had over there, it was a quick war, very definitive war. Thank goodness. Um, if, if you have to have one, those are the kinds you want. Um, but uh, just learning the environment and how our pilots who are called warrant officers operate and our enlisted soldiers who are our maintainers of the helicopters and the vehicles and our non-commissioned officers, the, the real heartbeat of the Army. Um, you know, I was never exposed to those before. At sure. West Point, it's all officers generally. And so um, just figuring that out was really, uh, and doing it in a combat environment was really cool. When I look back, I, I just grew you know, as a leader so quickly, so much because I'd, I'd listen to them. I didn't think I knew everything. I came in very humble, um, but uh, just tried to really kind of get the heartbeat of what they like to do and, and how, you know, how a, a well-functioning unit operates. Um, and there were some that aren't, but uh, I got lucky enough to really have some people that pulled me along and, and helped me as a leader. I imagine like you learn some leadership skills, you know, through going to school and stuff, but nothing, even like being in sports, you learn like, yep. different leadership skills, but sure. probably nothing like going to war and all of a sudden giving six helicopters and a bunch of people. And so what, like, what did you pull out of that experience? Like, what's like one takeaway from that experience that you learned that's defining from that, that experience? Yeah. I, I mean, some of it, honestly, I did learn, you know, at West Point as they're teaching leadership. Um, when I played baseball at West Point, I was, got lucky enough to be the captain of the team. And so there's things that those little things and how to lead, you know, peers and groups, um, all that paid off uh, when I got in that environment. Um, and a few things I mean I learned is when I mean, you got to set the example. That's uh, I would say that's leadership 101. At least that's the first thing in the book. Um, but it's hard. It's not easy. Um, that doesn't mean you always have to be right. It just means you gotta you gotta be there. You gotta show up. You gotta set the example with um, your technical skills for one in the army. Like for me being a pilot, I had to be competent. Um, I couldn't you know be this person that didn't know how to fly. Even though I was brand new, I just worked really hard at it, studied hard, kind of proved my, myself on the technical side. But just how you treat people as well. Like, do you respect people? you respect the lowest ranking soldier to the, the highest ranking? I mean, and, and how you treat those people is a, is a way you need to set the example. So things like that, um, just showing up and being there for my soldiers, which seemed kind of natural to me, I think, just due to my upbringing and respecting people. It didn't matter where you're from or whatever, just that kind of intangible that I had from my upbringing really paid off because literally, I mean, there's some jobs that are not great, um, especially when you're deployed out in the middle of the desert that the younger enlisted soldiers typically get tasked with. And I would just show up and be there and help them. And they they were shocked for one, but I just felt like, why would, why would we be over here sleeping while they're actually doing the crappy jobs that they got assigned, right? And so I think that's a big part of leadership that I learned is just being there, uh, being there when you're not supposed to be. I mean, go beyond expectations. Like there was no expectation for a lieutenant or a captain to be, you know, doing some, I won't even say what it was, but doing some pretty tough stuff. And, um, but boy, by showing up and being there and, you know, jumping in and helping out, the trust that I, that was gained by that and, and from my soldiers was pretty incredible and it just pays off as you as you go forward they they completely trusted me um and they they kind of knew i had their um you know any decision i made i had their interest at heart right it wasn't like i was doing anything personal and i was literally putting them in front of myself and in ways i would think and they appreciate that um from any leader so uh those are things i learned kind of in a, a real situation besides you know, flying into the technical side of, of, you know, moving aircraft around the battlefield, that kind of stuff. The personal side and the gaining the trust was was really critical. And, uh, and then I had some leaders above me that really pushed me and allowed me to operate outside the box and grow me um, as a lieutenant, which would then pay off when I was a captain and a major and so on. So I was super fortunate in that regard as well. Um, that's interesting because it's so easy to, like, it's so easy to, like, when you become a leader and you're not expected to show up and do the hard things, it's easy to like not do them. Yeah. You know, if I scale that right, even down to the trades and line work, it's pretty easy to like become a foreman and then just like 
use the excuse of sitting in your nice air-conditioned truck, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, filling out paperwork, quote <laughs> unquote, and not getting yeah. outside and grabbing a shovel and help get you know get that hole dug or something like that. So mm-hmm. I know it's small scale, but I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's definitely so relevant. it's true. And another story I'll share from that experience. Um, there are a couple of missions where like all the helicopters wouldn't go, and so on one I didn't get selected to go, so I was kind of hanging back. I was the guy on the radio, you know, commanding and controlling the, the aircraft and it, and but. While doing that, the enlisted soldiers had to form a perimeter. We had, at this point, gone into Iraq, enemy territory, and set up camp. And so we had to have security set up. And so literally they're sitting in foxholes all night protecting us from the bad guys coming in. And while we're either working the mission or sleeping, and I was like, man, I just feel like I need to get out and see the troops. And so I would kind of hop around in foxholes throughout the night. And again, it would shock them that I would show up. But we got great quality time of just talking about life and about you know where they're from and what what makes them tick and those kind of things again that's for me it was as a leader just building that that base of all right this you know everybody takes a little differently and and things motivate people differently and so the more i knew about each one of my soldiers um the better we were going to be as a unit as i as i went forward and so uh, one, one of the evenings that it wasn't a funny story because we had all these Iraqi soldiers coming, like surrendering to us in the middle of the night. Um, we hadn't had that happen before, and of course, I'm sitting next to a, a young private that wants to take them out. Yeah, honestly, because I mean, we're all jacked up. We're like in sure. enemy territory, and <laughs> and they're like waving these flags, and and I was like, no, dude, you cannot, do not shoot that. You know, they're surrendering, and so just going through that process and helping him process that was, you know, if I wasn't there, who knows what would have happened, honestly. So. Um, it was kind of cool that I was there to, to give a little bit of, you know, big picture, like, yeah, we, we, we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, we treat people humanely and, and honestly, and then going through the process of getting these Iraqi soldiers and, and, you know, getting them on the ground, taking their weapons and, and then ultimately they were just starving. And so we just gave them some food, gave them some water and, uh, we, we didn't have the capacity to keep them. And so we kind of just pointed the way to Baghdad and, send them on their way. But just that kind of the humanitarian piece that um, I think I really was in a good spot to, to teach that that soldier or something. So it was pretty cool. That's what separates us from them. Yeah, yeah fair. Yeah. yeah. We, we do operate by yeah. laws of war. And yeah, um, it's, sometimes it's hard when things aren't going right, but the leader really has to be the one setting that example as well. So you come back from Desert Storm. Um, what's your trajectory after that? Yeah, so I got to come back. Our unit was in Savannah, Georgia, so it was a good place. I, I got married a few months after I got back. Uh, we were engaged before before I left, but um, got married a few months. So that was a, obviously a great event in our life. And um, I was a platoon, platoon leader for another couple of years, um, doing the same role, but um, peacetime, you know, but uh, you know, always training for, for the worst situation. And then we kind of go to a captain's course um, in the Army. So right as you make captain, you go – Everybody goes and kind of gets recalibrated in the schoolhouse before you go be a commander. The captain's the best job in the Army, I'll be able to tell you, is a company commander. So that's when you're a captain and you have anywhere from 50 to 150 soldiers and equipment and aircraft in our case. And um, so you go back to kind of the schoolhouse for a bit. Again, I wanted to do something a little different. Um, Typically, an aviator would go to the aviation schoolhouse. Um, I said, I want to go to the infantry one. Um, and so it was a pretty rare thing. It was definitely harder. It was a path to get me to, to ranger school and some other, you know, hard army schools that, um, for an aviator, that was the only path to get, get there. And so got lucky enough to get a slot and go there, um, to do that. And, you know, of course everybody's like, you're an aviator. What are you doing here? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, no it kidding. was at Fort Benning. So where you and I got yeah. to spend a little time together. And so I spent about six months there. I'm um, going through that course and then got the, op- you know, you never know if you're going to get a company command but that's the ultimate and while I was there I got called from Fort Bragg which is kind of a cool place to be stationed and said hey we'd like you to take this Apache company command and uh, so I was on a good path there I got to go there and and lead an incredible company of Apaches for about a year and then got offered another company command after that Um, and so at Fort Bragg it was it's a unique place because that's where the airborne is you know I'm sure you know is based out of and um, I got to, I wasn't just flying aircraft, I was jumping out of aircraft too. And so that was, that was a pretty unique and fun time in our life and getting the chance to lead incredible soldiers. That's insane. Um, 
so out of this, like if I switch gears for two, well, not really switch gears, but like if you think about the trades and you think about where Quanta's going with aviation, where the industry is going with aviation, is there like a piece of advice for the pilots that even work for us or with us, uh, pilots and the line workers that work with them or the workers that work with them? Is there a piece of advice that really sticks out for them from things you've learned? I mean, it's such a exhilarating profession, right? Flying and being or hanging out the side of an aircraft, right? But it's super dangerous. I mean, we all know that. And so just never get complacent. Um, it's it's something that we try to talk about a lot in the aviation community um, because, man, you, you, you stop thinking for a second and bad things can really happen. So um, just try to avoid complacency, um, have accountability partners like we talked about earlier um, on the job site or on the helicopter that'll kind of keep you caged and focused um, for those, you know, discrete times that you really need to be in the game. Um, I think that's probably the best advice I could give them. Yeah, I had a, I had a guy on the podcast a few weeks ago. His name is Brandon Hill, and he was in a helicopter accident where he actually was, he just transferred. He was doing a skid transfer, just transferred from the structure to the skid, belted on, And the pilot caught the tail rotor or the wing on the back and made contact. The rear rotor made contact. Mm. He rode that helicopter to the ground, landed on the opposite side of him. So luckily he survived, Mm -hmm. broke pretty much every bone in his body, but recovered. And he's still working in the industry. He flew after that. He did did Mm. more after that as well, like more transfers and things like that. Um, But I asked him the question like, did he realize because it was it was a new pilot uh a new contractor that they were working with like new bird everything and they were just doing things a little different like if he he says if he looks back at it they were coming in a little too quick the pilot was just doing things that were a little different they had comms in the back of his head if he thinks back he he realizes there was opportunity like say something so anyway what i'm getting at is like i talk about communication a lot i talked about communication with him and is if you feel something inside or something just doesn't seem right to not be scared to communicate that that's so good yeah Yeah. i totally agree with that 100 percent. yeah i mean this mission set um with quanta the aviation is totally different than i was used to right both are very challenging this one seems crazy like we were always taught to fly away from wires well the Quanta helicopters fly <laughs> well, two wires. As close as you I'm can like, get. You guys are crazy. Um, but super, you know, I have incredible respect for the talent that it takes to do that. Um, and, you know, and the line workers on the outside, it's even more crazy. But uh, they're super talented. And, uh, yeah, just don't get complacent. And like you said, if you, if you have that little sense, you know, that spidey sense or something going off, you need to say something. Um, or just be communicating all the time about what you're seeing and that because that piece of information may be important to the pilot or the crew member that may not be seeing that or thinking about that that's something that i learned uh just even if you translate that right to like a bucket partner and i think duke asked me this question because he sees uh just statistics wise sees north of the border in canada seems to be a percentage i can't remember the percentage safer than self like in the United States and he's wondering why and he kind of asked me that question and I didn't really have a solid answer other than the culture's different it's a noticeable culture difference but what I learned was like and I'm sure they learn it down here I just don't know but what I learned was uh to always be communicating and always like if you're up in the bucket with somebody um just be saying hey three feet above your right shoulder face hot so good and just like constant communication like one person's looking one way. If you got wire moving with the bucket, one person's looking one way, one person's looking the other, mm-hmm. and you're constantly sharing, hey, stepping a little low behind you, coming up a little, like Love whatever it, it is, yeah. it's constant two-way communication. And I'm sure that exists here. I'm sure there's a lot of guys out there like, yeah, we do that. Mm-hmm. But what I have noticed is there's a lot of guys that don't do that. Yeah. They get this like chip on their shoulder, like don't flip and talk to me. I know yeah. I'm a JL or yeah. whatever. The And it's just, hundred percent wrong. You should be like talking. It's not, it's not, has nothing to do with ego. It's like, we're just letting you know, even if you do know, just go, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say there's no, no room for that on, in this environment. Right. Or in any of the previous environments I was in either. And we've had to, 
kind of check the egos at the door and you're all in it together. Um, you're doing some really dangerous things. Um, and, and with my, my crews in space, like we got to the point in training where we were completely transparent, um, with communication, with what's going on. Hey, I didn't sleep well last night. I need you to watch me today. The, I mean, even to that level. Um, uh, and those things transferred over to space and it just helped us be a better team. Um, literally, I mean, cause everybody's not going to sleep great every night in space and Hey, guess what? You know, my kid's sick or my kid got an accident in a car and that's what I'm worried about today. Not what I should be worried about on the job. And we need to know that. Like when I was the commander of the group, I needed to know that so that I could watch that person or just maybe remove that person from that task for the day so that we can get somebody that's got the head completely in the game. And that stuff's going to happen. That's life. Um, and you don't have to power through that all the time. And so don't think that just communicate to the leadership and your team um, so that, you know, we can just make a good decision on that day or what's, what's best for the team that day. That's a piece of being a good leader too, is like creating that Absolutely. environment for people to feel safe enough to Absolutely. be vulnerable and say, Hey, I'm not doing good. I can, and you see it in some crews and in some crews, you don't see that at all because of whatever reason it's ego or whatever it is, but they just don't want to be vulnerable with the people they come to work with. Right. That's very common. You can imagine that. Astronaut core, a lot of yeah. overachievers, yeah, sure, you know, sure. type A personalities, and, <laughs> yeah, I and got to this. get people to that level where you know they could open up, and yeah, you know, it doesn't just happen overnight. Um, I I was when I was a commander, I was intentional to do this throughout our training, uh, where it just became natural. It wasn't weird. It wasn't you know you weren't like less of a person because you admitted something that you weren't doing perfect, and uh, and just over time that creating that culture really paid off to give us the most effective, highly productive crew, you know, on a crazy outpost, you know, hundreds of miles away from earth. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was pretty cool to be, to see that kind of come together and then see it actually in practice. And, and honestly, we didn't, I didn't really notice it when it, I just knew we were operating really well. And when I look back on a mission afterwards, I'm like, that's why, or that's one of the big reasons why. I mean, the, the people I was with are super talented For sure. and incredible, but, but so is every other crew and a lot of them are, are not as functional as we were. So let's, this is a great segue. So let's talk about space. When, when, when did you decide, like how on earth do you go from West Point to astronaut and what did that gap look like? And, and when did that? Yeah, there's a, it's a crazy process. Um, there's several ways to get in the astronaut program here in the U S um, one of them is through the military and that's what I did. Um, but most of the astronauts these days are civilians, so they're they're teachers, doctors, engineers, scientists, and they'll come through kind of a different route. Um, back in the mid to late '80s, when I started applying to be an astronaut, we there was a selection about every other year, and so through the military, a, a, a letter would come out, and then you could apply. Um, I couldn't do it every time, honestly, because the command climate in the Army is interesting. Like some of my commanders they would not be favorable and, and I have to get buy off from them. Like, um, and so if I would have submitted, I just had to, to feel out that commander and because you're leaving the mainstream army. Right. So sure. some of the commanders are, think that's a bad thing. And, and, but some see the big picture and wow, this would be amazing. Right. So, yeah. So I had to kind of do that dance throughout my career. I applied, uh, perseverance is a good thing, by the way. Uh, um, good trait to have. I applied four different times to be an astronaut. The third time I applied, I was teaching at West Point. Um, so I'd, I'd kind of taken you through those commands that I told you about earlier. Then I kind of went to graduate school at Georgia Tech after that. And then a payback tour for that was to go teach at the academy. Okay. Really incredible, amazing experience. Even though I didn't want to go there, I wanted to go back in the helicopter and shoot things, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, getting in academia, not really my world, but it ended up being one of the most rewarding tours I had because I was investing and pouring into cadets, the future officers of our army. Um, even though I was teaching some subject, the real thing is you're teaching them leadership and about their future. Um, so really, really important. Anyway, while I was there at West Point, um, I did apply again. I didn't get selected, but I got a call from NASA saying, hey, you were one of our, um, from the army detachment in NASA saying, hey, you're one of our highly qualified candidates. We'd like you to come down to the Johnson Space Center and work for a few years. Uh, which was a good sign because um, I'd known the history of the Army people that were, had been there before me, and that's kind of the same path they went on. So um, my wife and I were like, sounds like a pretty sweet deal. Let's let's go give it a shot. 
Um, so we come down and for a couple of years, uh, unfortunately, the Columbia accident happened while we were here working. I wasn't an astronaut yet, but I knew all those people. I was working with the, those people every day almost and flying with them. And um, so that was a real tragedy. But honestly, it, it motivated me to want to do it even more um, to honor them, if nothing else, and to honor the program. And so when the next selection came around after that in 2004, um, I was lucky enough to get selected. Um, so we had a class of 11 uh, of us that got selected out of, you know, thousands and thousands of applicants. And so the chances are very, very small, and, and you can't ever bank on being an astronaut. The, yeah. I mean, the chances aren't zero, uh, but they're pretty small. Right? They're pretty two. close to zero. Yeah. So, but somebody's got to get picked, and that's kind of the, the way I felt and um, got lucky enough again. Um, I, I say after wearing them down three or four times, finally. It must come with a lot of pressure, too. Yeah. So, there's some pressure. There's, um, you know, the interview, once you get to the interview stage, if you're at that stage, that's why I tell people, you can never ask for more than that. Um, cause you're in about the top hundred out of the 20,000 or something. Um, and then you're going to go through a bunch of medical testing and lots of medical testing <laughs> and a few little aptitude things. But then just, the, um, there's a one, one hour interview you have in front of the selection board. And that's, you know, for most people, that's a stressor um, because you're sitting at a table of these very accomplished astronauts. And, just getting grilled. And getting grilled. And uh, honestly, you know what? They, they kind of just ask you one question. They say, tell me what you've done since high school, which is an interesting question. Um, and then how you phrase, how you answer that question over the next 45 or so minutes um, is says a lot about you. Let me put Summed it that up way. in a couple of sentences. So, what, did you, what was your, what so, did you say? I mean, I, I kind of just, I told them kind of my history, uh, but the way you tell that story is what's yeah. important, right? Is it, hey, I was number one at this. I did the best at this. If, if there's a lot of eyes in there, probably not the person you're looking for, right? Um, so that just the way, you know, hey, I was lucky enough to be on a great team and, you know, serve in this capacity and, you know, that kind of stuff is the way I took it and apparently it paid off. Uh, but honestly, I think they're looking at you um, – if I was on a selection board, I'd be looking across the table at that person and I'd be like listening to them talk, how they tell their story. Is this someone I could be in a very small area with for six months? Yeah. <laughs> right? Because that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Could you fly with this person? And if you if you couldn't, then they're probably not the right person to get selected. So, you know, this is this is great though. Like, I love what you're saying because it's like directly relatable. Um, I get a, a million DMs from young people wanting to get into the trade or just in the trade. And a large portion of those questions are like, how do I get through the t aptitude test or the yeah. testing, or I got to go in front of the IBW <laughs> and, you know, plead my case kind right. of thing. And that's the great, great advice. Like, yeah, I mean, they listen to that, just be scale a team it down to player, their level. man, be a team player. And the way you tell your story, hopefully it's, it's more about the team than about yourself. Um, and whether you get that job or that, whatever, I think in the long run, it's going to pay off just having that mentality um, and always wanting to be a part of a team. Yeah. Yeah. It's better than, you know, oh, I just want to make the money. Yes. It sounds like good money. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a piece yeah. of it, but I wouldn't lead with that. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not a motivator in the government. That's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, no kidding. so we had to do that for a different reason. Um, and, and lucky enough, honestly, to serve in those capacities. So, so what does training look like? What does training to be an astronaut look like? Um, so you come in as a class. Our class of 11 showed up, and for about two years, uh, I'll call it basic astronaut school, but it's high graduate <laughs> level, right, stuff, <laughs> where back when we came in, the space shuttle was still around, and so we were in academic classes, um, daily, 8 to 5, kind of normal schedule, but it was a grinder. I mean, it was um, every system on the space shuttle or the space station or orbital mechanics or you're in the simulator, you're in the pool, you're flying jets, you're learning how to fly aircraft. And all those things were uh, were tough. I mean, it was fun. It's, again, a shared experience with 10 other of my really close friends as we, we got to be over those two years. And cooperate and graduate was really the motto and getting everybody through it. You didn't want people to not make it through. And so, you know, study groups and and stuff like that were very, very common. Um, a movie has just come out about one of our classmates, if you haven't heard him, called oh, really? A Million Miles Away. No, I haven't seen uh, that yet. Michael Pena is the actor in it. Oh, but, awesome. uh, it's about this Hispanic astronaut that was in our class, and his, his story is incredible. So highly recommend it. A little plug there for the movie, and my classmate, Jose, 
Um, his story is really fantastic, but uh, we get, so we went through all these shared experiences. Survival schools is, are part of it as well. And, you know, you, when you first show up as an astronaut class, they generally like within week two, they send you to a survival school. And so that's how you really get to know somebody, right? <laughs> no so, kidding. So four of us, I think in our class were military. So this wasn't completely new to us, but uh, when you throw a teacher or a doctor, an engineer in it's survival, <laughs> survival situation, <laughs> You, live in this box for <laughs> yeah so you get to uh really get to know who people are um and none of us know everything and that's part of it is is realizing where you're strong where you're weak and oh my gosh i can't do this very well but that teacher over there knocks that out of the park and so as we come together as a team or a group you realize uh, to take advantage of everybody's kind of strengths um and then cover the gaps with the weaknesses there's a lot of guys out there listening right now that are in the process of building a team, you know, whether it's just like they're a new foreman or they're, they've been stuck with a group of people and they have to bring these group of people together to accomplish a common goal. Uh, same, similar thing. You got like one takeaway that you could say for those guys. Um, I would say, I mean, investing in your people I've seen over the long run is super important to any successful team. Um, and that means different things to different people. Um, yeah, I mentioned this story early, but an investment I made in my team was to go out, you know, to show up where places I wasn't expected to be, right? And I think that transfers over to any job, really, as a leader. Um, that's an important one. Um, taking responsibility is a big one as well. If something goes wrong on my team or my unit, I'm ultimately responsible. Um, I could add nothing to do with whatever that soldier did that evening, but it's my responsibility. And so it's, that's a hard thing. I think with this new generation is taking responsibility. That's something that's, I've struggled, you know, just seeing it through my kids and things, just a different, different generation. So I've tried to impart on them like, Hey, if something happens, you do something wrong, what you're going to do, you're going to mess up, own it, take responsibility, talk to it with the team or whatever you're with, and then let's grow from it and let's move on. Um, instead of putting blame on people and things like that, which is very common, very easy to do, to blame others. But, uh, yeah, take responsibility is a big one. Uh, yeah, because it's nice. hard, too. It is hard. Right? And but it's the right thing to do. Yeah. If you discipline and train yourself to, like, do hard things, then it makes it, it a little easier. It's still Fair. hard. But, <laughs> Fair, yeah. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's, you know, see, like I was at some point in charge of 150 people, right? Literally, one of my soldiers does something bad on the weekend, I, I felt like I failed that person. Um, and so that's how much I internalize it and that, Hey, I didn't brief him right. I didn't, you know, we should have had a better safety briefing or we should have, I should have inspected his car better. So he didn't have a blowout or whatever it was, you know, I just felt that sense of responsibility and, and took it. And, you know, we came back Monday morning for, after whatever happened, I would stand up in front of the group and say, I'm sorry, this is my fault. I let you down. Let's try to do better as a group. Um, and boy, that really goes a long way uh, when you're talking to the troops. Um, taking a rocket to space. <laughs> Walk through that experience. Yeah, it's just it's so amazing. I wish everybody could have that experience because it's hard to describe. Um, I was fortunate enough to fly on three different vehicles, which is pretty unique. Um, nothing to my doing. It's just the way things lined up. Um, space shuttle most powerful vehicle ever built, um, most complex vehicle. I've just, you know, very, you know, sense of American pride, of course, because it's this incredible vehicle that really was the workhorse that built the International Space Station um, over its last couple decades. And so launching on that was the most dynamic ride, most fun, because you're side by side with the rocket, uh, where the other ones I flew on, you're, we were on top of the rocket. So, um, I would say it's more like you see in the movies where you're, you launch, you're shaking around, you're moving around, you're pulling crazy G's and accelerating crazy fast. And it takes about eight and a half minutes to get to, from the launch pad to space on the space shuttle. And so people kind of are surprised when I tell them that for eight and a half minutes, I was just laughing continuously, right? This is the greatest roller coaster ride you can ever be on, right? And my crewmates are doing the same. I mean, we're certainly focused on what you need to focus on, but boy, we were laughing and I couldn't believe the experience that I was feeling. Um, um, my second flight was with the Russians on the Soyuz rocket um, launching out of Kazakhstan. 
very small rocket. Um, again, we're sitting on top of the rocket in, in the capsule. Um, some stages would fall off on the launch sequence, um, but very smooth ride relative to shuttle. Um, and then the third one I flew on was SpaceX. Again, it's a capsule on top of a rocket. And I'd say that was somewhere in the middle. It had some really fun parts. <laughs> uh, they only have two stages on the SpaceX rocket, the Falcon. And after the first stage separated, you're kind of in kind of free fall for a few seconds. And then when the second stage lights, man, it is super impressive. <laughs> and so thrown back in your seats and G-forces and pure acceleration for the next six or so minutes. So, so. it goes and then you start falling a little bit? And then well, it, 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 is the first stage it? shuts off. Like yeah. you've been powered. Gotcha. Just imagine the engine shutting down. So you feel like you're, you're sure. in space or floating for about 10 seconds or so until that second engine stays lights. And then, man, it is impressive. <laughs> so and kind of a cool rumble feel um, once that, to ride that out the next six minutes or so. And uh, it was really, really impressive. So. I don't know if that described or answered your question yeah, at all. Yeah, but it's, no, that's, that's it's pretty cool. But, uh, and we fought all those, well, the, the first and third vehicle pretty much launch up the east coast of the United States, launching out of Kennedy Space Center. You go up the east coast, and the shuttle, a um, few minutes in, you kind of roll over on your back. And so we're inverted flying up the east coast of the U.S., um, just accelerating, going from zero to 17,500 miles an hour or 32,000 kilometers per hour in about eight minutes. So pretty crazy wild <laughs> wow so you don't have to do no dumb, wonder you're laughing you don't have like, to do math very well but you just gotta know that's a pretty fun ride yeah so, yeah. Uh, yeah no wonder you're laughing like i imagine you, you've got as close to the feeling as possible in simulation and different things not like even that. close not even close. simulators simulators are not they can they just can't do it yeah so wow. until you do it for real you never yeah. never done it so it's pretty fantastic you're probably so. like leading up to that super you know like any human super nervous and like excited and all the all the emotions yeah there's oh. a lot of emotions for sure and everybody's a little different so it's kind of sure. kind of interesting to kind of look around the crew and see this what stressors and how people deal with the stress and i was on all three of my launches super relaxed i felt like i was exactly where i was supposed to be at that moment in life right i was completely prepared trained well by hundreds and hundreds of people yeah the equipment we were wearing i was super comfortable with um and that's something i tell people if you're really nervous or scared and you're getting ready to do a high risk activity, just think for a minute, um, are comfortable with the equipment I have or the training I received? And if not, um, let's call it, let's stop this and we'll do it another day. Um, and so even at NASA, like we've, we had to push a couple of launches back. Um, our team just wasn't ready um, on this last SpaceX one. So we, I, as the commander, I was like, yeah, we're not doing this. So let's regroup, let's retrain, let's refocus. Um, and maybe that delayed us, delayed us a week or 10 days. It didn't matter. I just wanted to make sure we were all ready to go. Um, and so that's a great trade, I think, that can translate over to the, the trades as well. 100% um, scalable. If, if that day, whatever, everybody's not ready or the equipment that was there that was supposed to show up for safety and it didn't, well, let's just wait another day. Wait for that piece or whatever it is and do something else that day. So don't push things when you don't have to. Nobody's ever going to question you if it's, if it's safety, you know, I if hope you just so. say like, Hey, <laughs> that's correct. Yeah. Well, if they are, they're right. in the wrong and you should know right. that hundred percent. Yeah. If but it's, it's for, but it's hard. It, yeah. It's hard to be the leader and make that call. Um, you can imagine at NASA where it's an international program. There's, it's not just us that that affects, it affects the whole space station flow. It's a big, big deal. But again, it was that important to me, uh, with a piece of equipment that, that was not functioning correctly, that we needed to get that right before we moved on. How long does it take you to get from Earth to the space station? It's different. Um, the Russians have perfected it a little bit these days because they can get there in three hours um, to orbit. So it takes about an hour and a half to orbit the Earth at the speeds we're going. And so they get there. A friend of mine just launched. Uh, she launched with the Russians last week. Um, and I couldn't believe they got there in three hours. So I was just watching. I was like, this is insane. When I launched with the Russians, it was a two-day deal. 34 orbits, so 48 hours or so. Miserable. Those are probably the worst two days of my my space existence <laughs> because that that vehicle is tiny um, and there's not much not much on there, and you're just kind of not doing much. Um, there, you have a window every now and then to look out of, but 
that's the benefit. Are you just but, seated the whole time, or by, by no, the time you're in space, you can kind of get up? And, you can get out of your seat, get out of your suit, um, but before docking, you got to get back in your suit. But it's just, I mean, you're you're face to face with the other person if you're if you're not in your seat, and it's just, it was a tough couple of days. But uh, but they've since obviously they got to like a day rendezvous and docking, and now it's about three hours. So that's pretty cool. Space uh, SpaceX vehicle now is about a day in general. Um, and is a, again, the Russians now have flown this same vehicle for about 50 years. And so having known that and, and the predictability of it, it's, um, they can get there. Now you're, you're, if you get there quicker, you're taking some risk. And what I mean by that is it's not the most fuel efficient way to get there, right? And so um, you're maybe taking some contingencies out of, out of play that if this happens, you're not going to have enough fuel for this and that sort of thing. But again, it's proven over the many years and, and they're comfortable with it. SpaceX takes about a day because they've only had seven launches, now eight launches with humans on them. Um, and so once that end gets a little higher, sure. the space station program will get more comfortable and they'll be able to do a quicker rendezvous as well. Space shuttle took about two days to get there um, because of that was the fuel efficient way. And we were protecting for every contingency that could happen um, on the way there and, and From really experience. on the way home, so yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so docking the space station and joining your crew up there. Walk through that a little bit. Docking's pretty amazing. Um, on the space shuttle, it, it's one of the few manual things that is done where the commander is actually flying it. Um, and so when you have two vehicles that are going 17,500 miles an hour coming together, it's pretty sporty. Um, and of course, the close <laughs> sporty is a good description. Yeah, the, the closing rate is very slow for a good sure. reason. Yeah. Um, and generally, there's only one docking mechanism on the station. So if you mess that up by coming in off angle or too fast, then nobody else can dock there, right? So <sighs> there's a lot of pressure um, on the on the shuttle crew. The seven crew members we had, everybody had a job. Um, really high high intensity kind of deal, and we're all helping the commander make the right decisions and as they come in to dock this thing. Um, so that was pretty cool. The The Russian vehicle and the SpaceX vehicle were automated docking. Although of course, as we train in simulations, automation never works and you always have to do it manually. So we're always prepared to take over manually. Um, during our Russian docking, we had the commander had to take over manually because um, we had a failure coming in. And so he did that great. Um, on the SpaceX one, when I was the commander, we um, had to pause manually for a bit because the lighting conditions were not what, what was expected. Um, uh, and our, we have a floodlight that kind of comes in and illuminates the docking target for us. Well, that wasn't working. And so I literally couldn't see anything. And so about 10 meters out, we stopped. And uh, so then you're just literally flying 17.5, but you're hovering 10 meters in front of the docking target, right? And uh and the vehicle's incredible how it responds to that and, and just maintains its position uh, until the lighting got a little better. Um, again, that was a hard call as a leader. Like, you know, everybody's waiting on you to be on time and to make, you know, the whole mission control team all around the world wants you that you're supposed to dock at this time. But we made a call. The pilot and I were like, yeah, we, we can't see anything. Why would we try to dock this and potentially mess this docking target up? And we were only the second operational flight of this vehicle, too. So it's still in the test phase. And. So we paused for a bit, um, made the right call you know, in the long run, and then uh, docked when it was appropriate. But the cool thing then is, you know, it takes a couple hours once you dock for all the pressures to equalize before you can open the hatches. But that's really a cool moment when you get to, especially when you have rookies on your flight and they're trying to fly for the first time, right? And <laughs> they're all clumsy and going across. And uh, but then seeing your buddies on the other side is really a cool, cool time. And uh, and. For a while, you have about 10, 11 people on the space station, which is way too many Yeah. Um, due to the limited resources, I'll say, with sure. like one one bathroom and one, one exercise. Just a constant equipment. rotation. So of it's, uh, you know, after a couple of days of seeing them, you're ready for that other crew to go home yeah. <laughs> to, to free up the resources in the sleep stations and things like that. But uh, it's really it's always neat to fly with friends, of course. And if you get the the good fortune of flying with a classmate that you went through all that initial training with, that's even more of a bonus. And I didn't get that chance until my third flight. So that was really special. 
what was weightlessness like for you? Because, like, again, you can simulate it all you want to try, but it's, I imagine it's completely. Yeah, there's no simulation really we have on Earth. And everybody, a lot of people think at NASA we have this room you go in and punch the button and everybody floats around, but we don't have that. We yeah. have gravity at NASA too. Yeah. So. <laughs> So really the first time you do it is the first time you really experience it. And it's really a state of free fall if you think about it. So if you anybody that's done skydiving and you're free falling, that's what we just do all the time. So you're in a constant state of free fall. The vehicle is going so fast that you're not falling, right? You're staying. Sure. Um, but the way, the way you get to operate and live and work is so unique. Um, and they train us, you know, as, as I'm sure you imagine, NASA trains you on every system, every you know, emergency that could happen with the vehicle and all this, but nobody trains you on the little stuff. Like, how do you fly? How do you go to the bathroom? How do you brush your teeth? How do you eat? And so to me, all that stuff was so intriguing and, and you just get better and better at it. Right. And, and, uh, it's just fun. It's fun watching other people, especially rookies coming up and, um, just doing the little things is, is what you don't get trained on. Cause there's no environment to do that here on earth. Totally. You, can, you can hear about it from your buddies and what it's really like, but and I've so, seen videos of like, I imagine even learning things like this, like wringing a rag out, wringing the water out of a rag and just watching the water yeah. and then just like soaking it all back up again. Yeah. Like weird little things it's, like that. It's just, such a cool, yeah. there's no up or down, right? So we could be having this conversation and I could be upside down and it's completely normal. So your brain, it's amazing how the human brain just changes your environment so quickly and that becomes your new normal. Um, and then when you come home, it's like, wow, this gravity thing. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's well, not wait, your friend. Gravity go is back rough. to space for a second. Yeah. But what's gravity like when yeah. you hit Earth it's again? It's brutal on your you body. You feel like you're four thousand pounds. So heavy. Um, you break a lot of glasses and cups and things because you're used to like setting things and expecting yeah. them to stay there. <laughs> and uh, doesn't happen here on Earth. Your so. Wife changes everything to plastic. She did on the last one. Yeah. She was she was very smart. Paper plates and plastic cups. But uh, oh, that's so good. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's such a cool environment, and and I hope more people get the chance to to get, get up there and experience it. What's a day in the life on the state space station like? A normal day, um, we're on GMT is the time zone we're on. So basically the time it is in London generally. So it's, I think they picked that because it's the two major players are U S and Russia and it's kind of in the middle. That's my, my take. I don't know if that's <laughs> true or not, uh, but kind of a, a standard time zone. So we get up at 6 AM generally, um, go to bed at 10 PM. We work from seven 30 to seven 30, 12 hour days. Um, and they're full, full pack days generally. So it's, I would say, you know, honestly, about 50% of our time is spent doing experiments and research, um, that come from people from all over the world. So it's really, really humbling and special to be part of something. You know, you could be working on an experiment from uh, a scientist in India, maybe one day and somebody from, you know, Washington state the next day and, um, all with two, two goals in mind, all the research we're doing, it's not for me, it's not for NASA, it's to help humanity. So we're either helping humanity um, with things we're doing or we're helping future exploration. So um, there are experiments on board that we're doing that are gonna eventually help the moon program or help the Mars program. And so everything we do falls in those two buckets. Uh, and if they don't, if they're not designed to help people here on earth or future exploration, then honestly we don't do them. So it's pretty cool. So that's about half our time and so you know, as soon as we have a conference at 730 in the morning with all the mission control centers around the world and you kind of just touch base with them. And so I might be working on a Japanese experiment. So they need to tell me something or a European experiment or a Russian experiment um, or a U.S. And so they kind of kind of you tag up at the beginning of the day for 15, 20 minutes with all those those folks. And then you close the day with them as well um, based on, hey, I didn't get didn't finish this because of whatever. And we'll reschedule for tomorrow or um, they'll just kind of, you know, just close the loop at the end of the day. It's kind of nice. And then in the middle of those 12 hours is when we're off and running. And literally there's a, a red line that goes across our timeline all day. And you're just trying to keep up with the red line, uh, with all your activities and everything scheduled literally, you know, every five minutes you know, plus, um, all day, about two hours of every day is working out, um, which I really enjoyed cause you're kind of away from everybody, everything, mission control leaves you alone is kind of for me, my private time, I like working out anyway. Yeah. So that's a good time where you can, you know, while you're working out, you can listen to music or watch a movie or watch a TV show, whatever kind of gets you through the workout. And uh, the workouts are hard and challenging again, um, really, because you really need to put that stress and pressure on your body um, so that you don't lose bone density. Um, that's a, 
if you just go to space and hang out for a couple of months, your bones are going to deteriorate. And we found that over the years the hard way. We found that out. Didn't know that, you know, early on. And so we figured out if you work out about an hour of cardio, an hour of, of resistive weightlifting exercises every day and eat the right calorie amount every day, you're going to come back with minimal or very low bone density loss or none at all. So pretty impressive that they've figured what does that weightlifting out. weightlifting look like? You have to like pull against the hull or something? No, like? we have this machine. It's fantastic. Oh. It's a, it's one machine and literally you can squat, bench press, deadlift, shoulder press. You can do everything on it. And it, it floats as well. And so figuring out that motion of you're doing a 300 pound squat with this thing that's moving. Is, <laughs> and you can be upside pretty, down. Or yeah, while well, you, you kind of are. And yeah. when you're running, the treadmill is literally on what we would say is on the side of the wall. So you're running parallel to the ground and uh, but you're you're harnessed into sure. it so that you don't go floating away while you're running. It gives you a great workout. We have a, a bike as well. All those machines um, are on a floating system, so that you're not imparting loads into the space station, right? So if you if, if it was bolted to the station and you did a squat or something really heavy load, it would put you know stress on the space station and the solar rays literally would be be affected and things like that. So the scientists and engineers have figured out really cool systems to operate. Um, so let's see, about half our time is doing experiments, a couple hours a day of working out. And then the other maybe quarter is, um, you know, meal time, uh, maybe doing emails, calling home, those kind of things uh, that you do in the evenings, usually after hours. Uh, but generally during the day, we're, we're working hard. If you get done with an activity earlier, early than you're supposed to, guess what? You just go help a buddy. You know, you jump in with them, get them done earlier. Um, and sometimes you're doing things together, which is great. Uh, that's really I like like doing things you know with groups, uh, but most of the activities were solo, um, and so it's always cool to, to go hang out with another crew member. The Russians, the cosmonauts, generally are down on their end of the space station doing their activities driven by Moscow, and we're kind of on our end driven by our, the other mission control centers. And so, if I ever got done early, another thing I'd do is just go hang out with them for a bit. You know, float down there, have a, have some tea with them, or or help them out with what they're doing and just, you know, just a nice connection point to, to keep the crew. Uh, otherwise, you really go all day without seeing the cosmonauts um, and maybe all week until the weekend where you kind of would come together for meals. So um, I made it you know, a couple times a day. I'd go down there and, and see what was going on. That was very cool. Yeah. The, the human in you, your experience, your personal experience with space, some things you learned uh, about yourself or about humanity or, you know, explore that for a second. Yeah, I, I was – so fortunate to fly with so many different um, countries that were represented. Um, this last one was Japanese, France, I had French astronaut, Japanese astronaut, cosmonauts, and Americans. And so, learning the cultures and learning what what's important to different people is so so cool. And all of our a lot of our training too. I got that experience where I spent so much time in Russia and a little bit of time in Japan and in Europe throughout our training. Um, but just being exposed to different cultures and realizing that, you know, everything over here is not the way it always should be or always is. And just having that just experience just allowed me to open my mind a lot. Um, having the experience of, you know, on space station with these people where we get to celebrate all of their holidays, um, all of our holidays too, and getting the chance to sit, you know, float around the table literally and, and celebrate one of a holiday I'd never heard of, right? Because sure. that was important to the Japanese culture, for instance, and they get to explain it. And they generally they'll they'll have thought of this in advance and send up special things for the meal and things like that. And so it's really special to kind of to to be with a team like that that gets to share experiences that you never would have otherwise. Um, another thing from space station is just looking out the window, right? Looking back at planet Earth is most special thing i think every astronaut will tell you that was the best thing i mean mean, the lasting memory is looking out the window it's thank goodness we have pictures and and got to take a lot of pictures and capture those moments because you know your your mind kind of forgets a little bit and and the view is so special but to me that just helped me realize how fragile this place is Um, this incredible planet that we had to live on is super fragile Uh, we got to see the thin layer atmosphere that protects all of us from living and dying down here and and it just gave me a better appreciation to want to take care of this place, honestly. And uh, it's the only one we have currently, anyway. I mean, there's there's talk of getting out to another planet, you know, down the road. And but uh, right now, we got to take care of what we have. What's something else special that you talk about the aurora? Uh, describe that a little bit. Seeing that from space. Yeah, the, the auroras are. This last mission, they were 
they were plentiful, I would say. Uh, the previous mission, uh, maybe out of six months, I maybe saw five or six auroras, which are special, don't get me wrong. But this one, we were probably seeing that many every week, sometimes every day. Um, just the activity, the solar activity just happened to be, I guess, ripe for that, which it doesn't always mean it's great for the, the planet. <laughs> but uh, it was cool viewing. And some of them were so vibrant, and we, it literally felt like we were flying through them um, because literally the you know, the gases would kind of be going out the, the sides of the spacecraft as we're flying through. And, so um, they stretch that high? Or yeah, I, think it's like a, I think it's a bit of an illusion sure, um, because okay. – I don't think they stretch that high, but um, you, you kind of see them over the horizon as you're coming. And generally, somebody if somebody was looking out the window and saw one, they just start yelling, and everybody get to a window with a camera. And of course, unless you were doing something where you couldn't do it, but um, in our free time, we definitely would do this. And then we all got to just enjoy it and laugh and and just I mean, they're all different, right? Um, but super special to uh, to see it. I think one of the most special moments our crew had was towards the end of our mission with this last one we were up there about 200 days and maybe on day 190 uh, we all got in the cupola which is a, a module up there that's all windows that, that faces earth all the time and so it's just a great special place to hang out for one i kind of would end most of my days there with my french astronaut crewmate and just we just hang out and kind of recap the day and just literally watch the earth go by right so cool. um, but we had a moment where um we just all we could turn all the lights out we knew it was gonna be a night pass we all got in there, all seven of us, which we were literally face to face. And every time you're in there, you you have cameras set up. You just want to capture the moment. And, and we had some beautiful auroras coming, um, but nobody brought a camera. Nobody, and nobody. We didn't say don't do it. It just kind of was a special moment where we all got in there. Um, we'd been up there for six plus months already together, and and got to share this moment where everybody was just looking out in awe of what we were, where we were, and what we were doing and getting to share this experience together. And it was silent for about 30 minutes as we're all in there just just looking at this aurora and looking at Earth and just realizing, realizing how special um, this moment was and that moment was. And, and what we what we got to do for a job was, was pretty incredible. That's a big to, takeaway again, for anybody, just, you know. Enjoy the moment, yeah. right? Um, take those special times you have to, to see that sunrise, that sunset, that you know, whatever event is going on, you know, pull your team together and just share moments together. It's, it's pretty cool. Talk about spacewalking where you do no walking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spacewalking is um, definitely the most dangerous thing we ask any any astronaut to do, um, to go outside a perfectly good spacecraft and and uh, go do some work, right? But it's, you know, I, there's a lot of similarities, I think, to line work. Um, and literally this last one I did, I think I, I might have mentioned that we were installing a new solar array, so that's <laughs> another good tie-in. Um, brand new solar array, new technology, and it was the first time it had ever been installed on the space station. Um, we have legacy ones that have been up there about 20 years, and this was a whole new technology, much smaller, more powerful. And ones that we hope, this was a technology demonstration, we hope will be used on the space station around the moon over, uh, throughout the next decade. And so it was you know, cool to be a part of something like that. A lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, things don't always work right. Um, on the first one, we went out to install it. And this is on the very end of the space station. So very few people have ever been out this far on the station. And my buddy and I, the French astronaut, and I were like, man, we were looking at each other like, this is the wild, wild west out here. I mean, they're because typically you move around on handrails and it's very structured and, and it, you know it from your training in the pool. And we were out in like no man's land where there weren't handrails. There weren't, we're, we, so we were like, how am I going to get from here? You know, wow. we had to be pretty creative and, uh, and not let people know kind of our stress level. And, no uh, kidding. How uncomfortable this might be at the time, but it kind of all worked. But the, the one thing that didn't quite work so well was when we installed this solar array um, at the very end of the station, um, it was folded. So the idea was to unfold it and then it was going to deploy. Um, as we unfolded it, the, uh, and they were supposed to be, you know, these holes were supposed to line up perfectly due to the engineering. The engineering wasn't quite perfect. And so the holes did not line up right. So we literally couldn't install it. We were about four to six centimeters off um, from the holes lining up to the the little the thing it was supposed to connect with. And and so Tama and I tried a few little things just, you know, just on our own to try to make it work. Couldn't get there. So, um called Mission Control, of course. I mean, they, we have helmet cameras, so they're watching, and they see it. And um, So there was some talk, and, and finally it was like, all right, got to fold it back up. We'll tie it down, leave it in position, 
come back in. We'll try to figure it out next time. And so this, this is where really NASA really shines is when things aren't going well. The team comes together. Uh, we got the, the company that made this thing and the engineers that designed it and, and a huge team of folks um, probably while we were sleeping on station, they're doing all this work um, and figuring out a way to make it work. And so they gave us some techniques to try. So we went out a couple days later, we go back out. First technique we tried worked um, and got it installed, even though it wasn't perfect, right? Because the engineering just wasn't perfect. Sure. But, but we worked through the issue and we got it installed, we got it deployed uh, and it works incredibly well. So, um, you know, we kind of fought through that little, little bump in the road uh, with a great team helping us out and uh, that's that's just a great tribute to the the teams on the and ground. A great example so. of like use the team around you, use the expertise of you know lean on the people around you and what they're good at. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So the spacewalking in general is just nuts. I mean, it's it's when you take out a rookie, that's another uh, another challenge for you as the lead spacewalker. You go out with in groups of two if you didn't know that. And um, I remember on my previous flight, Tama and I flew together again, and I took him out on his first two spacewalks, and this guy is. Stud. I mean, super capable, way more capable and better spacewalker than I am. But on the first one, you're so jacked up, right? Yeah. Um, kind of like and, diving for the first time. Yeah, you're just yeah. so hyped up. But by being hyped up and moving too fast, you're using all your resources, sure. right? I mean, you have limited resources in your backpack of oxygen and carbon dioxide removal and things like that. And so thank goodness we were both going to the same place on that first one for him. So I could be the pace man. And literally just, I was going so slow just to, because that first hour is pretty critical sure. uh, when you go out to make sure um, you're going to have enough resources by the end of the day. It's about a seven hour, seven and a half hours spacewalk generally. So I imagine your hands and your arms and stuff too. Everything like gets, gets ripped because the, the suit you're in weighs about 300 pounds. doesn't weigh anything in space, but it's still a 300 pound mass that you have to move around. Sure. And it's pressurized. And so it's completely blown up, makes it super stiff. So every time you're opening and closing your hands, you're fighting that pressure. And like so working with rubber gloves. Your hands and your forearms are pretty ripped up, your shoulders and um, the way that suit moves. And so it's it's a cool, cool experience. Now, it probably took me, like you said, I had nine, but uh, which is amazing. I think the record's 10, so <laughs> I was pretty close. I mean, a handful of people have 10, I think, but um, never thought about that. Never thought I'd even get to do one. Um, but doing the, f the first couple I did, I don't think I ever looked at Earth. Like, I was just so yeah, focused. focused. <laughs> like, and literally, I mean, for seven hours, you're mentally drained because literally everything you're touching or every tool you're grabbing, you're making sure the tether's on it. And so it doesn't go, doesn't go floating away and you're managing all this stuff and these new new hardware you're putting in or, or old stuff you're taking out and you're mentally drained. But uh, I think the third or fourth when I actually had a trouble, I was driving a bolt in a, in a thing and it just wasn't going in. So mission control said, Hey, give us a few minutes. Uh, let us talk about it. At that point I was like, I've got a few minutes. I can look around and uh, finally look at earth and just be blown away. Like, because you're, I mean, you're in your own little spacecraft at that point. You were that's traveling that's at 17,500 yeah. miles an hour yourself. Wow. And, and it is pretty crazy. And uh, but what a spectacular view. And I mean, when you actually detach from what you're doing and you can actually process that thought right yeah. there that you're yeah. just one man in a small yeah. suit. <laughs> like <laughs> the pretty, smallest little spaceship crazy. you could have. But you get caged back pretty quickly. As yeah. soon as it's game on again, it's, yeah. you know, and our training's fantastic that gets us ready for that on Earth and with the team that does that. And um, the cycles, you know, as we're going around the Earth every 90 minutes, if you think about it, half, half the Earth's dark, half is light all the time, right? So every 45 minutes, we're going to, if you're outside, you're going to experience a sunrise or a sunset. You don't get to see them and experience them as, as much as you like. What's the temperature change in Temperature there? difference is crazy. So when the sun's out, it's about 200 degrees C. So 400 degrees Fahrenheit or so almost. And then as soon as the sun goes away, it's minus 200. So 400 degree temperature swing every 45 minutes is pretty, you know, you're, the suit protects us from that, thank goodness. I mean, you definitely feel it's getting hotter or colder, but not those extremes, thank goodness. Um, and yet another thing people don't think about is we, we don't want to sweat while we're out there. So we try to stay on the cold side because if you sweat, you, you really can't do anything about it. Right. And so sweat's going to start dripping down your face. And it's not like, of it course, every time, every time I go to try to wipe it off and my, hit my, hit my visor. I'm like, what am I thinking? This is such a natural reaction, but, um, so we generally try to stay on the cool side. Now there's going to be times where you're struggling with something and working hard and, 
you're going to start sweating. That's just the way it is. But uh, we have a cooling kind of control knob on our suit that helps us out with that as well. But uh, yeah, to me, I kind of left it in a neutral setting and, and could kind of pace myself. I was working too hard or not working hard enough based on my temperature. Um, and so I'd kind of just regulate myself that way. When you out the door, is it is there like a feeling of falling? Like you feel like you're falling back to earth? Or? <laughs> That's a very common sensation. Um, the hatch, the door, the hatch that we go out of is facing earth when you come out. So you kind of come out generally head first and it gives us people the sensation of falling, which is not comfortable at all. Um, but it's, I didn't have that, thank goodness, um, but uh, a lot of my colleagues did. So, you know, I was aware of that when I go out with somebody just trying to check them out the first five or ten minutes to see how they were doing and. Uh, seeing if they're they all right or not. But we go through buddy checks. It's very similar to, to any job that a line worker would do. You kind of look at your buddy, make sure everything's hooked up, all your tethers are connected, all your tools look good, you're not tangled up or anything before you head out to, to the work site. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's very similar, a lot, a lot of similarities, I think. When we get to the work site, it's, it's very challenging, um, especially in that environment where um, everything's floating and you're trying to move and you're trying to be stable to drive a bolt or to, to put a new piece of equipment in and, um, it, it can get, get pretty tough at times, but uh, again, we have a huge team on the ground. That's, um, yeah, I, I say literally holding their breath for seven hours while you're outside, but they're really there to support us. And Hey, if we're struggling with something, they can see it, or we can show it to them in a helmet camera or a different camera view, and they can help us work through the issues. So it's a huge, huge team effort. Uh, big picture here now, where do, like, where are we headed? Where are we headed with space programs, with space in general? The moon, Mars, that sort of thing. Yeah, as, as most people are probably aware, the, um, the private industry in the space world has taken off, um, literally. And more people are getting a chance to fly, more common people, well, well wealthy common people sure. at this, at this yeah. point. <laughs> at this point, um, that's but what it starts with. But hopefully it'll, you know, the airline industry started like that too, right? So hopefully a couple of decades, maybe every common person will get a chance to fly. But So that's exciting on that that front. Um, NASA, NASA has ambitious goals in the next couple of decades as well. Uh, the next decade here coming up is all about the moon, um, getting back to the moon, not just going there, but actually living there and creating habitats uh, and learning all we can about drilling for minerals or water and those kind of things, getting the right tooling figured out. How do we transfer power up there? How do we get power up there? How do we store power up there? All those things, because those are things we're going to have to have when we send a human to Mars for the first time, which is a couple of decades away, probably. Um but it's a mission and a goal that NASA has set. And uh, I know other people like Elon are, are on that trail as well. And so um, it's going to be a collaborative effort. Like no nation, no private entity can do that on their own. I think it's going to be a nice international and private commercial collaboration to make those things happen. How far is the moon from Earth? So the moon, uh, just in rough terms, like I tell people, space station is about 250 miles above Earth. Really not that far. People can picture that. Yeah. Moon's about 250,000 miles. So a whole magnitude, you know, greater, long ways away. Um, and Mars is, it varies obviously, but, you know, 34, 30 to 40 million miles away. So Unbelievable. obviously different challenges to get to those different locations, right? Um, but uh, so that's why we haven't been to another planet before. Mars is the, the one that's closest that we can actually put somebody on. Uh, we put rovers there, as, as everybody's aware, I think, and, and other things, which is a great precursor to send in humans. But um, hopefully one day we'll have people in and robots and rovers working up there together. Do you ever see anything from space that was a little unexplainable? I did not. Uh, everybody wants to know that. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, I was the guy that saw <laughs> that. But no, I mean, honestly, if you looked out the window and saw something, it, it would be a bad day um, sure. because of the speeds that things travel. Um, no matter if it was the size of a little rock or a rocket body, if that thing hits the space station or your vehicle, it's a bad day. So uh, we have, again, incredible team on the ground that protects us, puts about a 200-kilometer sphere around the space station. And if any object that, that's – all these objects are tracked, by the way, by um, resources in the U.S., I'll say. <laughs> and uh, um, if anything's going to come within that 200-kilometer ring, it's a – it's a, an event. And so we can move the space station out of the way if we have enough notice. If we don't, um, and it's potentially going to hit the station, then we they'll put us in our vehicles uh, that we flew up on and just kind of wait. If something hit the station, and we could then detach and come home um, and keep us safe. And so there's different ways to do it. But again, a, an incredible different team 
um, that looks out for the debris that potentially could affect a spacewalker, which would be really bad, or a vehicle um, as well. If I asked any of the greats that have worked with you in the past, what was or is Shane really good at or Jaspi? Um, I think bottom line is just taking care of people. I think, um, and, and the investment I made in people is, is recognized. Not that I ever would do it for that reason, but I think, uh, I've heard people and old, you know, former people I've worked with and, um, just, you know, Hey, he's a great guy, but, but they really truly believe it. And they believe that, that I have their best interest at heart as, as the leader when I was making a decision for them or for our, for our unit. Uh, wasn't always a popular decision, but they knew I always had their best interest, interest at heart, and that's because of the trust that, that I built up over the over time um, and the, the bumps in the road that we worked through together. And they saw my humility, I think, is another big piece of being a leader and don't think you know it all and, and learn from them. Um, another thing probably is that I always wanted to learn, so I was always a – I consider myself a lifelong learner, which I think is important. Um, never get stable and – and content with what you have, just try to keep learning things. And hence I'm in a new industry here, right? Yeah. <laughs> learning something completely different um, to that point. But uh, yeah, I think in general, they, they would just say that uh, he was genuine um, and they trusted me um, based on the relationships we'd created. We talked about this new industry that you're a part of and uh, a little bit about leadership through this episode. Um, what does a good leader look like to you? Man, a good leader. We've talked some of the traits earlier. Um, Biggest thing, being genuine, being, um, you know, taking responsibility when things don't go right. Um, when things do go right, you give responsibility away to the, the people that earned it um, and don't take it for yourself. Um, showing up, we talked about that earlier, just being there when you're not expected to be there. You know, going beyond people's expectations of what you should be or what you should do. Um, setting the example, the way you treat people is super important. The respect you show people, no matter if it's, you know, the lowest person or the or, or the boss, um, the way you treat them, other people, other people always watching you when you're the leader, whether you think they're watching or not, they are, and so um, for me, I just that just became natural for me, and again, I had a lot of great help with my parents and and friends and things growing up to kind of teach me respect and and how that should look, um, and so it was natural for me. So it wasn't like I was faking it or doing it like that. So if that's not something you grew up with, you can still do it and you can learn how to do it and do it well. So I encourage you to do that. Um, gosh, well, there's some other great leadership things. Um, we talked about taking responsibility before. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's just, I mean, there's a handful of traits that I think every great leader should have. I, I see the leadership of this company now and I see those in them as well. Um, and it's, it's encouraging. Like I didn't know what to expect in the private sector, right? I'd, I'd been around a lot of great leaders in the military and even at NASA and um, in the government side of things, but I've uh, been super impressed with the leadership here and, and the, a lot of the traits I just mentioned, they all possess um, and they're real. Like the, they're just so genuine, right? They're not putting on a show or anything and, and you know that right off the bat. Um, and part of that's just being, you know, humble and, and knowing, knowing your limitations, knowing what you're good at knowing where you need to get help um, as you drive, you know, a company or you drive your team or whatever it is. This trade is, uh, like all trades, I imagine, but speaking specifically for line work, notoriously hard on family life. Uh, from someone who's spent a long time away from family, what's some advice on managing your family, managing those personal connections? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, and it's tough. And every family dynamic is different, right, for sure. Um, but... My, my wife is such a rock and she's really been the key through this whole thing. And, but we were very intentional with how we raised our kids, how we um, tried to keep things normal when I was off the planet, you know, which kind of sounds weird, but um, it's just the environment our kids grew up in. They didn't really know a different one. And so we tried to keep things normal, um, staying connected uh, with your spouse or significant other. That's super important. Um, and we weren't always, you know, perfectly doing that, but we learned lessons along the way. Our intent is always to be communicating and stay connected. I, I'm not great at that communication side with my spouse. My wife is great at it. And uh, so I've grown over the years and, and it's, we've had to in order to make this work. 
um, because, and I honestly, until this last flight, this third flight, I don't know why that's when it hit me, but it, but I just, I, I kind of understood at that point the stress I was putting them under by doing what I really love to do. Um, I didn't, the first couple, I just didn't think like that for some reason, but I matured enough at that point to realize, wow, all right, I had no idea what I'm making you go through. <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of, you know, line workers, military people can say that as well as they go do a couple of deployments or a couple of long trips and like, wow, I had no idea what I was putting you through. So um, that humbled me a bit um, and helped me recalibrate like um, what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, <laughs> honestly. And it was time to hang that that up and do something different for one. But uh, yeah, the families, I mean, my kids are were amazing. They were at three distinct different stages of life during my three missions. And so when they were really young for shuttle, they honestly didn't really care. They just knew they got to go to the beach in Florida for a couple of days and see their cousins, right? Um, Dad was gone for a couple of weeks. It was no big deal, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is, uh, when I flew with the Russians, they didn't have the opportunity to, to go see the launch even, but uh, they were in mission control and they were uh, freshmen in college and then in high school. And so they, they were Understood internalizing it a, it a little more, right? And the stressors and um, and the, the people that were around them, they they realized, all right, this is a pretty big deal. And then this last one where they were all young 20-somethings and definitely internalized it and and thought it was really cool because it was, it was SpaceX and Elon. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Versus That's not cool NASA. Yeah. NASA, who cares? But this is SpaceX. and uh, But the family said, I mean, I try to tell people, we try to keep it real when I was on orbit as well. Like literally they would, if they had trouble with their homework, they would email me. I say, email me the homework. We'll work on it up here. Like if I can't figure it out, somebody up here can, right? And just try to keep that normal, right? And like a normal parent would do if they're at home. Um, which is, but it was cool. We had the technology to do that, right? Yeah. And we could even. <laughs> How fortunate. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and on Sundays we could, we could do a dad. video could... chat and we could kind of work through some issues there if we needed to. But, but, you know, we still have struggles. Like a kid would get sick. A kid would be in the hospital. A kid would be, you know, it's getting trouble or whatever. That's, that's life. Right. And working through that. And, um, if my wife wasn't so amazing and, and, and our communication and our expectations leading up to the mission, um, kind of weren't set. Just like I trained my team for orbit, um, my crew, I kind of, we had kind of had to train as a family as well, um, just to kind of make it a minimal impact as possible. And so that's very important. Um, and so, um, the hardest mission my wife will tell you too, was the Russian one, because the training for about two years leading up to that, about every other month I was in Russia. So I'd go to Russia for a month, come home for a month, rush for a month. Oh, go to, go to Japan for two weeks, come home for two weeks, you know, go to Russia again. And so those couple of years were tough because our kids were kind of middle schoolish, you know, tough years as well. And, and even when I was home, I wasn't completely home. I mean, we were kind of in this jet lag fog, um, all the time, <laughs> or maybe it's a lot. That's maybe why a month it's a at home, like... you you get a week or two where you're hundred yeah. percent. Right. And, uh, even though I felt like I was in, you know, I was still coaching teams and doing stuff and being involved where I could, but, um, she'll tell you that was the hardest for her, hardest for the kids, which I didn't necessarily see that side. I knew it was not great on me, but, um, yeah, so those kind of things are tough. And so, and other people in different professions have very similar, um, schedules like that. So I know that's a, a real thing for many people. You transferred now to the private sector, um, civilian world, whatever you want to call it. Blue collar. Why blue collar? Why does blue collar matter right now? Um, yeah, I'd known Quanta for a while. I, I didn't know, honestly, what they did very much. <laughs> I just knew it kind of at a surface level a company and met a few people from Quanta. Um, but when I started digging into it and looking at places, opportunities to work outside of NASA and outside of the government, um, I always kept coming back to Quanta. Um, and now I know why. I mean, the culture, for one. Um, I had the good fortune, the honor of serving my country for 37 years in the government. Um, I didn't want to give that piece up when I did something else. And when I came to Quanta, I honestly feel like we are serving our nation. We're serving North America and even Australia, right? So I, I didn't have to give that piece of my heart up, honestly, and my work ethic up because the work our people are doing out there in the field is supporting our nation, supporting Canada, supporting Australia. Um, to be part of something like that is still very special. Um, and so 
that's one thing that I just didn't want to have to give up when I went to private sector. And this was probably the only company I felt that I looked at that I felt that that was the key. And so coming here, that was a huge th reason I wanted to come here and got the opportunity to come here. And then once I got here, um, kind of going back to the culture, I, it's very similar to the previous life that I had with the military and with NASA with, you know, people in the field are working in small teams, very dangerous environments, um, high risk environments. Um, you've got to kind of be zoned in and locked in every day and focused. Um, otherwise bad things can happen. And so um, it's, it's so special when I get the chance to get out in the field and see those and thank those teams that I get to, to see every now and then. Um, I wish I could be out there every day, yeah. like all of us, but yeah. uh, um, the job doesn't, doesn't lead me to, to do that these days, but uh, it's such appreciation for them and, and they're driving our company right now and really the heartbeat are the foremen um, that we're building and we got some special programs coming up with them that we're excited about um, to just really honor them and uh, keep this company going. We have great, the future looks great for the company and um, it's special to be part of something that's, that's big like this, that's driving positive change in our society. A couple closing questions for you, Shane. These are kind of questions I just pretty much ask everybody because they're interesting responses. Answer them however you want to answer them. One sentence, one word, whatever. Uh, if you could go back and give your 18-year-old self one piece of advice, what would that be? Relax a little more. Uh, I was a pretty structured kid. I bet. Um, and driven <laughs> I kid. I could see it. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'd probably relax a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, if you could live anywhere in the world now seeing it from above, where would that be? Wow, that's my wife and I differ on this. Um, I'm, I think I'd be in the mountains somewhere. My wife would be on the beach, and so Houston maybe is a compromise. <laughs> but uh, um, that's well, I don't know. I, I've seen some amazing places, and honestly, places that just I put on my bucket list to go travel and see. And uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know. That's I, I got to get back to you on that one. <laughs> so that's a t that's a tough. But I love just you know crisp mornings and then you know, pleasant afternoons and kind of leads to the mountain life and um, somewhere up there. I love skiing and, and getting outdoors and doing things like that. So um, I'll send you some photos from the Himalaya next. Uh, oh, month. nice. Yeah. Thank you. Going to the uh, the bottom of Mount Everest. So. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be cool. Um, okay. If you could have coffee with any historical figure from the past, mm. who would that be? Ronald Reagan. We kind of, when I was getting into West Point, I got a nomination to the academy from him. Um, and just, he was such a, I think a key figure for the, the 80s for me um, and getting in the military and um, just the way he led our country. I think it'd be a great one. All right, last one. Uh, what's the most valuable tool in an astronaut's kit? <laughs> wow. You talking about like like real tool it can or be any, any tool? It can okay. Be anything. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's just the ability to um, work with everybody, right? So you got to be somebody that's resilient, that can take a take a hit and move on. Um, you got to be able to work with so many different people, and whether that's your crewmates or the hundreds of people on the ground, that relationship is very critical as well. Um, and how you just how you interact with people is the biggest thing. Um, for me, and 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 if you could do that well, didn't matter your skill set at NASA. If you could deal with people and treat people well, that kind of trumped everything else. That's awesome. Thanks for hanging out today. Appreciate yeah, you thanks, being on Ryan. the show. It was great. Appreciate it. Super fun episode. I know you guys enjoyed that one. I sure enjoyed it. All right. If I could ask one favor out of you guys, let's go to our YouTube channel or go to wherever platform you listen to this audio version on. Make sure you're subscribed, give us a like, follow, share, all that good stuff. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.